Panamanians in green, they are stretched along <coughs> an, uh, a peculiar axis of a variation along the first and most important principal component. So it means that there is some peculiarity, some distinctiveness in their genome that became even more evident while analyzing through their mixture analysis. As Thomas already mentioned, that their mixture analysis give us the opportunity to reconstruct the different ancestry, the different genetic component in modern and ancient individuals. And actually here we reported the average value for each of the indigenous group. And uh, we can see, for instance, the light blue, that is a component that is shared by most Central and South American indigenous groups, while our, and is very, very low in our indigenous group from Panama. Those are uh, our indigenous group from Panama. While they are characterized by a specific component, here represented by the red color. So this distinctiveness is confirmed so what is the origin of this distinctiveness? We made, actually Marco made a lot of statistical analysis. One I would like just to show you here, it is quite complicated, but basically you use an outgroup here is an African booty, and then you test your population groups, in this case, our indigenous group from Panama and the ancient Panamanians against modern groups and ancient groups here. If you don't see any sign, it means that our Panamanians are equally related to these modern groups and to these ancient groups. Why? If you see a triangle pointing to one side or the other side, it means that they are more closely related and the population you see on the other side is an outgroup. So if we look at this comparison, these are all modern population, these are some ancient individuals that are representative of the ancestries I told you about at the beginning, ancestral Beringia, northern Native American, southern Native American from here on. Of course, uh, our Panamanians are more related to other modern groups, uh, the triangles pointing here, and the ancestral Beringia is the outgroup, is the source. It is also for Northern Native American, because they split from ancestral Beringia. But if we come to SNA, Southern Native American, we can see a different pattern. They are equally related as the others to Spirit Cave and to modern Panamanians, while ANSIC work as an outgroup to them. So we have this pattern that is confirmed, as you can see here, in Central America. Why in South America there is a different pattern? One in the Pacific coast, similar to Spirit Cave, while the other on the Atlantic coast, similar to Hansi. You see here a lot of triangles, a lot of triangles. So to sum up these results, we built uh, many actually, at the mixture graph, the most supported one, statistically supported one, is the one represented here. Through this graph, it seems complicated, but it is not. It's just a phylogeny where you allow also for admixture events. So if you have a split, while if you have a dot line, this is an admixture event. So starting from ancestral Beringia, so from the north, we have the split of SNA and northern NA. So northern Native American, southern Native American. But then the southern Native American uh, ancestry split in two different ancestries. So this is the novelty, and one of these ancestry is connected directly to Spirit K, as you can see by following the yellow lines. And it contributed the most to our ancient Panamanians. But also to explain the ancient Panamanian genetic component, we had to take into account and previously a known ancestry that we call Yupopa, a known population of indigenous of the Isthmus. Okay, so a new ancestry that came out. And this ancestry, the best representative of this ancestry nowadays is the Guna indigenous group, but it is present all over Panama, even in the ancient Panamanians. So testifying for the pre-Hispanic origin of this ancestry. 
Now, the problem with the Kupi graph is that no, you cannot estimate, uh, you cannot provide a time frame that is uh, so trustable. So back to the mitogenomes. We still have the mitogenomes. When we get full data from ancient remains, but also from modern genome, we can reconstruct also the mitogenomes, also at high, at high resolution. And so what we did, we built a mitogenome tree out of Panama, and we can see all the Panamerican haplogroup as expected. But more importantly, we found a specific Panamanian lineages. Specific means we found them only in Panama, modern and ancient individuals. So it means that they evolved locally. And if we, if we look at the age of these lineages, this is the most abundant one, especially in Guna, best representative for you, Bobay, we can date it to 13,000 years ago. Moreover, so it, at the end of the late Pleistocene. Then we can reconstruct also demography from the female point of view, of course, and we can see an increase in the population size starting from the early Holocene. So putting it together, the identification of Yupope, these age estimates, we came out with this hypothesis. There was the first preprint that is marked mostly by SNA1 that uh, moved along the coast and in, through the interior from the coast and uh, contributed to the peopling of both coastal uh, part of the southern continent. Then, later on, in the late Pleistocene, early Holocene, NNA remained restricted to northern South America. As in a two spirit cave ancestry moved to the southern part of the double continent, but mostly only on the, on the Pacific coast. You remember the different pattern that we identified. But to fully explain the gene, the gene pool of Panamanians, we have to, have to, to take into account an additional ancestry, Yupo pipe, that differentiated at the end of the late Pleistocene moved from in the north, moved into the East area, and then uh, triggered the increase in the population size about at the beginning of the early Holocene. Of course, to this paper, we didn't do it alone. There was a contribution from different institutions, uh, people that are also here, and uh, I'm still thankful to them. And now, what's next? Just uh, two slides. So. First of all, I was talking about low coverage genomes so far. So uh, we are now producing high coverage genomes. It has been mentioned before multiple times that just from a single genome, you can get a lot of information. We have some of them, actually five, that have a good endogenous content, and we are producing high coverage genomes from them. The other thing that we are trying to do, move to South America, through a multi-species approach. We are comparing the human data with the animal and uh, common bean data. We, there is a paper that is coming out in a few days and about uh, an indigenous group, the Ashaninka, in Peru. And actually, in just in an indigenous group, we were able, able to identify a lot of diversity that can be connected to different movements. So telling us how important is to go deeper in such analysis. And then uh, translating the human evolutionary into precision medicine in another work that uh, just came out last month, we were uh, looking for signal of selection in uh, uh, individual living at a high altitude in Ecuador. Who, and uh, I would say unexpectedly, we found the strongest signals of selection in a genomic region involved in immunosystem related to tuberculosis. And combining this uh, information with other analysis uh, on age estimates, uh, we can say that the indigenous people of Ecuador have adapted to mycobacterium tuberculosis thousands of years before the European arrival. It is in, in agreement that some uh, uh, mycobacterium tuberculosis strain were already present before the European arrival. Uh, I would like to thank all the people in my group. Uh, we have now a modern lab as well as an ancient lab that were, we, we were lucky enough that Svante Papo agreed 
to come to give a speech from our from the inauguration of this lab, but unfortunately it was in 2020, so this COVID pandemic came out and he was not able to come, but uh, we still have uh, the posting that uh, we have uh, presented. But of course we are, I am, uh, we are all, I think, particularly grateful to the ancient and modern people who share their DNA and make this research possible. And thank you all. For your different ancestors. So we have to establish a split in that case. Otherwise, it is not working. It's not deriving from one of the other. Otherwise, you have a source population and then a derived population. It, is, it was like two different ancestors that split the earth. Okay, but one more point. That, uh, when you mentioned about the single skull associated with uh, male uh, skulls separately. Mm -hmm. now, now, where are these all male skulls genetically related? That, that means they could represent some enemies or some adversary group who had killed and then placed there. Yeah, I mean, the, the way they were buried together uh, made the anthropologists and the archaeologists think that there was something behind it. There was just not people that were buried together. Also because it was like that the, the main skeleton was a respectable a respectable person is uh, came also from the pottery that were found buried together with that people, and so there was something behind it. Is more equal or more than 0.01x? Yeah, that, 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 does it mean samples one. from many individuals or one individual? No, no, it's for one individual we have information about 0.01% of the of uh, its genome. Okay. Which is a lot if in terms of SNP, it could be a lot. Then when you merge all the data it's together, really no time. of course you have to be... Uh, uh, okay, go yeah. with the oh, very short question. Yes, it's a very quick question here. Yes. So, uh, mitochondria is known to demonstrate heterogamy. So, when you uh, reconstruct these mitochondrial genomes from the genome sequence data, do you see that as a, as a confounding factor? Uh, Heteroplasmy, of course, in a modern mitochondrial DNA, we can see them, especially with next generation technology. From an evolutionary point of view, we don't take them into account because they are not fixed in the history of the population. But we do see heteroplasm is there. Not as so high level. I would say with the, the classical uh, Sanger sequencing, it was estimated that it was lower. Now we there are hypotheses also in the forensic uh, that, that there is a low uh, level of heteroplasmis below 1 or 2 percent that is maintained in the mitochondrial DNA, but it's not fixed. So it's not going to be transmitted. And there is this bottleneck during the maturation of the oocytes and during the, uh, and in the early phases of development that uh, like uh, wipe out most of the development. Okay, we are running short. Please, thank you.
Our next speaker is Professor Luca Pagani.